We join me in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today we're finishing our series on lessons for navigating the wilderness. Ever since the beginning of the year, we've been reaching back into our tradition to recover the lessons that our faith has to help us find our way through unfamiliar circumstances, new challenges that we don't know how to resolve, decisions facing us that we don't feel confident about finding the right thing to do. We all have to find our way through wilderness places in our own lives when the old familiar paths that we've followed in the past no longer take us to the places we want to go. And we all recognize that the church of Jesus Christ, including this congregation, has to find its way through wilderness as well. Today, we're in a very different place than we were even a generation ago. Church attendance has been in decline since the late 1950s. A lot of churches are closing. Being a member of a Christian congregation has become less and less significant to people with each passing generation. The old familiar paths that we've followed in the past no longer lead us to where we need to go. We started this series by looking back at the Exodus stories when Moses and the newly liberated Hebrew slaves were navigating their way through the wilderness of the Sinai, and we remembered some of the lessons that helped them find their way. The manna from heaven story reminded us of the need to break free from our nostalgic longing to return to the familiar ways of the past and to trust that God will provide us with everything we need as we move forward into a new day. Jethro's advice to Moses reminded us of the problems that occur whenever any of us try to carry more responsibility than we are capable of bearing. He taught us that the span of care should never exceed ten people for anyone. So that everyone is linked in a network of small, caring communities. The relational connections that are formed in our small groups are essential for navigating the wilderness. Covenant at Mount Sinai and the commandments that Moses brought down from the mountain remind us to keep our greatest values at the very center of our lives instead of lurching from one crisis to another. The golden calf story reminded us that's always tempting to place our faith in tangible things that we can see and feel and touch. Their act of idolatry reminded us to remain patient and steadfast in faith even when the results that we are waiting for are delayed. We learned a lot about navigating the wilderness experiences by looking back into the Exodus stories and recovering the lessons they have to teach us for finding our way through unfamiliar places. And then for these past three weeks, we've been looking at Jesus' experience in the wilderness beyond the Jordan, where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted by the devil immediately after his baptism as he was preparing to begin his ministry. Tom Ryberg began by inviting us to reflect on our own experiences of being led 
by the Holy Spirit in the midst of facing our deepest fears. Last week we wrestled with the impact that the word if can have when it triggers our insecurity and immobilizes us with self-doubt. Today, we're closing this series by focusing on Jesus, on Luke's postscript to Jesus' wilderness temptation, where he ends the story with these words, when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. It's not a real satisfying way to to end the story that Luke recorded. When the encounter between Jesus and the devil is finished, nothing really feels resolved. The threat of temptation is not over and done with once and for all. The power of evil is not defeated and vanquished for all of eternity. The devil leaves the battlefield, but the war is clearly not over. On the contrary, the devil vows to re-engage the struggle at an opportune time. Jesus wins a temporary reprieve from the devil's temptations, but not immunity. Temptation are inescapable. Next Sunday, we'll celebrate Palm Sunday, the day when we remember Jesus' triumphal entrance into the city of Jerusalem. It was in the midst of all that excited fanfare that the next opportune time presented itself. Luke tells us that when the festival of unleavened bread was near, the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how to betray him to them. They were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money, so he consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray him when there was no crowd present. Judas betrayed Jesus on the night when they were gathered in an upper room to celebrate Passover. After supper, they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray far from the crowds that had cheered them earlier, and that's where Judas arranged for Jesus to be arrested by the temple guards. Luke doesn't tell us why Judas did it. He doesn't reveal the mental calculus that led Judas to choose betrayal over loyalty. Perhaps it was as simple a matter as the temptation of wealth. He was promised a handsome sum in exchange for information leading to Jesus' successful capture. Or maybe Judas had grown concerned that the Jesus movement was getting out of hand. Maybe he did it in hopes that the temple police could keep a lid on things and prevent Rome from cracking down on the Jews even harder. Or maybe Judas thought he could further their cause by orchestrating a showdown between Jesus and the temple authorities since the cleansing of the temple hadn't triggered any overt confrontation. We don't know why Judas did what he did. What we do know is that the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness ended with the devil vowing to return at an opportune time. And being far from the crowds, alone in prayer, the Garden of Gethsemane was an opportune time. 
It was a moment of vulnerability. Jesus and all of the disciples were vulnerable, being far from their homes and their base of support in northern Galilee. In Jerusalem, they were all under close scrutiny. Everything they said and did was being monitored by the authorities, especially after Jesus disrupted temple commerce by overturning the temple money changers. Jerusalem was crowded with pilgrims who had come to celebrate the feast of the Passover, and tensions were already high, and the hint of insurrection would be met with swift and fierce repression. It was an opportune time because it was a moment of vulnerability, and vulnerability always presents us with a choice. Either we can choose to risk moving into greater authenticity by living into our deepest beliefs and our strongest convictions, or we can choose inauthenticity by succumbing to the temptation to compromise our beliefs and commitments. We can move forward in faith, or we can turn away in fear because it seems too threatening, too risky too disruptive, too costly to continue. The opportune time for the devil's temptation is always the moment of our greatest vulnerability. At a personal level, those moments of vulnerability come when job security is threatened. When relationships with people we love are floundering, when our health is compromised, when we're isolated, when we're feeling frustrated, discouraged, lonely, angry, disappointed. The devil's opportune time comes when we are most vulnerable because that's when we have to choose whether to live authentic or inauthentic lives. It's when we are least certain of the future and when we are deepest into our own personal wilderness that we must decide either to embrace our own unique strengths and talents and use them to serve in ways that feel authentic to who we are called to be and what we are called to do in whatever circumstances we are facing or to be inauthentic to opt for what is safe and familiar, to put financial security above personal fulfillment, to avoid risk-taking, to do only what we are confident we can be successful at doing. In our own personal lives, the devil's opportune time tempts us always coincides with our moments of deepest vulnerability. And the same is true for our faith community. The devil's opportune time to tempt us always coincides with our church's moments of greatest vulnerability. When we are struggling to stay financially viable, when the clarity of our shared vision is dim, when key leaders die, leave us. A few years ago, we faced an opportune time when we were tempted to turn away from our commitment to embody the radical hospitality of Jesus by reaching out to the LGBTQ people who have been excluded and persecuted by most of our sister churches. It costs us something to do that. Some people left our church and took their pledges with them. There was grumbling 
in the congregation just as there was grumbling in the wilderness of the Sinai. Some argued that we shouldn't be signaling out any group for special favor. Some wanted us to tone down the rhetoric and stop announcing every time we gather on Sunday morning that we are an open and affirming community. Some were alarmed to see people coming into our community whose gender expression and whose style of dress and whose family constellation didn't match our dominant culture. Some worried that we were becoming a queer church. There was the temptation to compromise our commitment to be an inclusive community. More recently, some have been tempted to quiet our commitment to social justice, to stop talking about white privilege and institutional racism, to turn a blind eye to patriarchy and Islamophobia and homophobia. For some, it feels like the church is becoming too political, that it's not the comforting community that once provided solace from our sorrows. When resistance grows, our members feel uncomfortable with the church's witness for social justice. It is an opportune time when we are vulnerable. That's when we have to choose between living authentically or compromising our deepest values and our strongest convictions. In the wilderness, Jesus was never tempted to do something bad. He was tempted to be inauthentic, to indulge his unique privilege, to satisfy his own personal hunger, to gain power and authority over all the kingdoms of the earth by sacrificing his faithfulness to God. to experience celebrity status and draw attention to himself with amazing, miraculous feats instead of drawing attention to the kingdom of God that he was sent to proclaim. Today, as we conclude our series on lessons for navigating wilderness, the devil's parting words to Jesus remind us that we are never free of temptation. We will always have to struggle with the desire to compromise our authentic selves in the name of some other good, preserving unity, maintaining financial stability, improving morale. But in our moments of greatest vulnerability, Jesus teaches us to hold fast to our deepest values and our strongest convictions. Amen. Oh,